You probably think that the fluid simulation has to be three-dimensional and very slow. But today we will make a fluid simulation that is two-dimensional and quite fast. In real life, water is made out of molecules. In one drop of water, there are around that many molecules. That's 200 times more than sand grains on Earth. Blender struggles with a few million particles, so simulating trillions and trillions and billions and billions of them would be quite impossible. Storing just the ID of each of these particles would require a tower of one terabyte microSD cards that is 15,000 kilometers high. There's only one solution. We lie. We let the viewer think that we are simulating the entire water surface, but actually we divide it into a grid and simulate what water would do in those grid points. So how does it work? Let's create the grid. The grid is made of points that we call cells. Each cell has a velocity vector to show the speed of water around this point, and this velocity field evolves over time by the direction defined by it. The velocity field can evolve however it wants, but the only rule is that the velocity vectors must not create any compression of the fluid. The divergence of this vector field must be zero. Divergence means stretching or shrinking. A divergent velocity field does not look like water, and that's because water is incompressible you can't make water act in any of these ways. So if you correct the velocity to avoid divergence, we are all good and the liquid flows freely. But that's everything you need to make a liquid simulation. So let's start. This is a new kind of tutorial format where we won't make everything from scratch. We will be using some pre-made node groups and I will explain why we do things. So the focus is on why instead of exactly the nitty gritty of the nodes. If you want to get the pre-made node groups, you can get the file with all of them from the description. You can just start creating into this file or append them in your own project. And if you want to get like the full from scratch tutorial, you can get this uh, actually if you sign up uh, for my course waitlist, which is free. And you guys seem to like this idea. So let's, let's try it out and let's see how it works. So let's get into Blender and let's open up some geometry nodes and let's see what our first task is. First task is to add a grid for simulation. Uh, sim, and let's add a grid that we want to use as the basis for our simulation. So let's get the grid, let's put the grid here. This is our simulation. So as you remember, uh, the grid has some kind of a resolution as you saw from all of those animations. So let's add like maybe 40 for our resolution. And this looks like that. And now the next step is to add a velocity field that actually is representing the water at those locations. So for example, if I have this location, an arrow that, that's pointing there, this means, you know, around, you know, in this area, water molecules will all move in this area, uh, however much there will be. Um, so let's add a very simple velocity field that looks like that. And for that, let's just add a store named attribute and let's add a velocity attribute. The velocity attribute has directions in it. So it's not a float attribute, it's a vector attribute that has three components for X, Y, and Z. And if you want to move to the right, just um, like the animation shows, we have to put some kind of a velocity here. Isn't this true? And if you want to now preview this attribute on the surface, then what we have to do is to add a named attribute node and inside here we can preview different attributes, like for example, the position of uh, of those points here, and also the velocity of those points that we just created. Now, keep in mind, you have to preview this attribute on the where it actually stored, you know, or it has to be stored when you try to view it, it doesn't work here. So we have this in place, but obviously I think you agree with me that if you have water that is moving to the right currently, it is red, then we cannot actually see this. I mean, it doesn't work currently if you play this, but even if it worked, we still couldn't be able to see this because the whole grid is full of that same looking water. So let's do so that we only make half of the grid having this liquid that flows to the right. So for that, what we have to do is, um, is to somehow eliminate uh, or select uh, this side and eliminate the other. And we can do this very easily if, you know, we just uh, take the position, separate this into X, Y, and Z, which is the same. And I mean, if, if on the X, the position of the uh, points is larger than zero, 
greater than zero, then we are going to store our velocity there. So we can do it, store it here. But now if you play this animation, I mean, still nothing happens, right? And that's because we are not doing this on every frame. If we were to do this on every frame, this should, you know, move like that to the right. Let's do this on every frame. Let's add a simulation node. Let's, um, and let's uh, add this here. And this sounds all good and, and nice, but I mean, still there is nothing in those simulation nodes that is moving thing. If you were to add like a transform node, for example, this one moves our grid, right? But what we need to do is to move our attribute. And for that, we can use an, a node group called advect. Now the advection node group does so that it moves the attribute, uh, in our case, velocity, could be attributes uh, called carrot, whatever we want, but we don't have an attribute called carrot, so we're going to use velocity. Now this moves the velocity by the velocity itself. So if you play this, you see, moves to the right. And if it's, it's you know, a bit too fast right now, so if we do like that, it is much, much slower. How it works internally is that you have the velocity attribute, and then you have this node called sample nearest surface. And that's going to do so that it's going to find, for example, in this location, okay, my velocity is going, uh, let's say here. Uh, so this means I have to take this value from here to there, the next frame. But what it does is that it does it in the inverse way, you see subtraction here. It, it's going to invert the velocity and it's going to take the value from here to the current. Uh, it has a lot of benefits, for example, if you have a lot of CPU cores in your computer, then, I mean, if you were to do this, then multiple things could point into the same location and then it would be like clashing and stuff. But if you do this the other way around, you just read from a certain position, you just read from here to there, so on. This is how it works and affects the velocity attribute by itself. But let's add a more interesting velocity field that is uh, just something worth watching. So let's delete this selection here and let's add a noise texture node here that acts as our velocity. I'm going to put this here and put this here. And now this looks like that. If you play, this appears super fast. This has many reasons. Number one, the velocity is just too fast. So let's take a vector math node and let's scale this thing down to 0 0.1, for example. And now see, you know, it moves, but it's very dark and also moves into only into one direction in, in up there, you know. That's because a noise field in Blender by default has ranges from 0 to 1 and not from minus 1 to 1. So it means it only moves in one direction. Again, a big fan of one direction here. And we need to get this range to be both on the negative side and on the positive side. So I'm going to add a subtraction node, 0 0.1. And now if you play this, you see it moves. Firstly, it's super dark. And secondly, it is having some massive problems, which we'll get to in a minute. First, let's fix the problem that it is dark. I mean, it's dark because the value has been multiplied with something. But if we make this, you know, stronger, what actually happens is that, you know, the velocity gets also faster, which is not what we want. We would like this to be, you know, slower. And also, if you, for example, add increased FPS, then it gets even faster. So we should make this frame rate independent. And for that, we need to introduce the time step. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to add a store time step node group. And this one allows me to input the FPS here of my scene, for example, 60. And iterations, let's ignore for this time. And it allows you to in introduce the FPS, and then it's going to divide 1 divided by this FPS. And it's going to store this as a delta time attribute. So if you are doing something, for example, 2000 frames per second, it's going to still multiply this smaller so that it's the same speed. If you're going to do this, I don't know, one frame per second, it's going to keep the same value. So it's always frame rate independent. And this thing here didn't work for me. That's why I made a whole new node group. Now we just have to go into the advect thing here and multiply the velocity that we use with um, a delta time attribute that is created. And this makes the velocity much slower. So now it um, looks like that. Even though it is, you know, super, super visible and uh, bright. In physics simulations, you use very often a time step, unless you have some kind of a old computer game where the physics speed is dependent on the frame rate. So when you look down, you actually run faster, which is <laughs> one of the funniest things, I think. 
So if you now see the surface of this velocity, you see it does look like liquid, right? It does look pretty much like liquid. But there are some problems which, and those problems are those strange lines here. And those lines are because of divergence uh, in this uh, fluid field. And the divergence, I'm going to explain this in a minute, basically makes it so that, you know, the vectors are nicely strolling uh, against each other and they're like, no, I'm not going to back off. And they just clash in the center here. Neither one of those is going to do like fluid does. You know, fluid is incompressible and ready for compromises. So it's going to just turn away. A fluid is going to turn away from this from this place. It's not going to, you know, just make like a, make like a duel there. It's just backing off. So we have to make those vectors act like a fluid. And we have to get rid of divergence for that. Divergence is how much water flows out of your cell. If the neighboring velocities all flow into the center cell, there is too much inflow and divergence is negative. If neighboring cells point away, then too much flows out and divergence is positive. Here no compression is created and therefore there is no divergence. The inflow and outflow are balanced for each cell. And the same happens here. The liquid has no compressing areas, it's just whirling around and this creates a perfect fluid velocity field. Because a perfect fluid velocity field doesn't have any divergent areas and is therefore incompressible. Our noisy field obviously has some compressing divergent areas and we want to get rid of them to get a nice fluid-like behavior. And we can solve this by calculating a counterforce called pressure. Pressure will push water away from those compressed pressurized areas. And to know our pressure, we first need to know our divergence. Because the divergence is the basis for calculating the pressure. So how do you calculate it? Each cell has four neighbors that can flow water in or out of the cell. Water can flow in or out in the x or in the y direction. So on each axis, one neighbor has to be for outflow and one for inflow. Let's make the agreement that for any cell, the up and right are outflow cells and the left and down are inflow cells. Each neighbor has their own velocity that shows where water moves around those neighbors. And the velocity is made of the x and y components. Let's find out how much is the net outflow from the center cell on the x-axis. So let's do outflow on x minus inflow on x, 3 minus 2, and we get 1. But since this is per two cells and we only need to know for one, let's divide the answer by two, 0 0.5. And let's do the same for the y-axis. So outflow on y minus inflow on y is four minus seven, which is minus three, divided by two is minus 1.5. And now let's add the x and y outflows together and we get minus one. So on average, there's a bit too much water flowing into the cell. And if we do this for all the cells in our simulation, we get the field like that. So let's calculate this in Blender to take our fluid from this to that. So let's find the divergence of this grid here. Not very hard when you have a divergence node group just waiting for you. Let's put this here, divergence. And this does uh, exactly what we just looked at. It's going to find the net outflow. So it's going to do outflow minus inflow, outflow minus inflow, multiply with 0 0.5 or divide with 2, add them together and wrote this, uh, write this as a divergence attribute called D. What does the D look like? Let's take the D, let's go to the first frame to rewrite the attributes. Let's click on the viewer and we don't see anything. I was getting worried for a second and then I remembered. Look at, the, look at the first frame of this animation. Each cell has four neighbors. Of course it has, but we are just not defining them. I mean, we are reading some data from the neighbors like, you know, oh, neighbor, right. But we are actually not writing, telling geometry notes where are our neighbors. So we should find the neighbors. To find the neighbors, uh, let's add a node group called store neighbors. And how it works is um, you know, pretty simple. So for example, for this cell, now think logically, how would you find the neighbors of this cell? First, you need to find what is the length of the uh, of the grid here. What is the length of the edge? Okay, you find the length of the edge. What do you do next? Uh, if we go inside, you see that's exactly what we do here. We store an attribute called edge length. That is uh, finding the length, length of each edge and each edge and writing this into every point. And now we just go up by this edge length, down and right and left by this edge length. Like we do here, we add this edge length on the y to the position. 
If we subtract this from the position, we add this on the x, we subtract this on the x, and we find the nearest point if we go up by this amount. So if we go here, like the nearest point most probably is going to be, in case of agreed, the neighbor. And we store those indices, index, we get the index of the nearest point. We store those as uh, attributes like left and right, and down and up. And indices are just like, you know, addresses of geometric elements uh, when you're doing computer graphics. So later on, we can, uh, for example, use a node called evaluate at index. We can put index, you know, 68 here. And okay, from this index, I want to get, I don't know, a certain value, like, I don't know, the radius of a certain point, for example. This is how those neighbors work. And now we have them in place. And what we can do is we can uh, see the divergence attribute. The moment that we enable the neighbors calculates itself and we get something like that. But is this the correct divergence? This is always good to know. Uh, if you're doing simulations, things have to be correct. So here's a way to uh, verify. Let's add a velocity attribute and set position. And let's move our grids by the velocity itself. It's quite strong though. So let's just scale this thing down a little bit and you see where divergence is negative we have inflow it is like shrinking there the water is flowing away from those areas and where it is positive too much is flowing in so now we need to solve this using a counter force called pressure if our divergence looks like that this means there are a lot of water molecules compressed into these lower areas and the pressure is super high there so we need a fixing vector that tells our velocity to turn back. Do not go into these areas. For this, we'll calculate the pressure the fluid is causing, and then up the slope of the pressure, we'll find some vectors. And if we subtract these vectors from our velocity, it will make the velocity turn away from these areas and become like a fluid because it backs off. And the formula is quite simple. The whole internet was full of them. We need to take the average pressure of the neighbor cells um, and subtract a bit of divergence. As you noticed, where divergence is negative, we have a lot of pressure. So if we subtract a bit of that negative divergence, it gets positive and nudges our resulting pressure to be, you know, more correct with each frame. We repeat this about 30 times and this nudges the pressure to be, you know, pretty correct for our non-scientific use cases and makes it act like a fluid. So let's add a little uh, pressure node group here, pressure. Let's put this here, and this has also an iteration count. What you have to do is, you know, first what we do here is that we make a guess for the pressure. Well, let's think the pressure is going to be zero. And then we are going to let the formula do its magic, and it's going to find guess the value, and it's going to get more correct with every iteration, which is like crazy, right? And if you're using an older Blender version, you just have to, you know, copy those iterations 20 times and add a pressure guess in the start and this is what you're going to do but we are you know uh the high supremacy race of uh, blender 4 so we are using a repeat input zone here and uh, 20 iterations how does the pressure look like let's get the pressure attribute and let's preview this pressure it looks like that divergence pressure aha i can see a pattern here so where the divergence is negative, for example, you know, you know, these areas right here, we have a lot of, you know, inflow, everything is flowing inside. It's a crisis, but pressure is very positive here. So it's going to just, you know, push the water away from those regions. And uh, this is basically what we need. But, you know, to push something away, you need a direction. So the pressure field currently is black and white, and this doesn't have any direction. I mean, we, it's not a vector. A vector has a direction. A float does not have a direction. And for that, what we need to do is, as you remember, find those vectors. And we can do this by, if you're using mathematical language, we find the derivative of the uh, pressure field or the gradient. Uh, maybe I just mm, use some very wrong mathematical vocabulary here. But the thing is, we have to find the rate of change, you know. So if you, for example, use the... Uh, set position and we put the pressure into the offset and we use a combine x y c z here you know the pressure is like that and we find have to basically find the vectors that you know point down from these slopes like that 
or point up from the slopes, doesn't matter. We just need those vectors. Whichever direction is okay, we can just invert if we need. And for that, we have a thing called correct velocity, a node group like that, which does exactly what we just described. It takes the um, outflow, inflow, outflow, inflow uh, pressures, finds the from the uh, right neighbor, finds pressure and so on, and it subtracts them and multiplies and combines them into a direction vector. So if you, for example, have something higher on the right side, lower on the left side, then you can subtract them and tell, okay, my I'm going up by this amount. This is how uh, taking a derivative uh, of a function works, which in our case is a pressure field. And what we do in the end is that we subtract them from the vector just as promised. And this should, in theory, make our velocity turn um, you know, back and be a bit more of a fluid-like thing. So let's preview the velocity. Let's add all, remove all of this nonsense here. Let's play this. And I would say it looks definitely better than it looked before. If you remove correct velocity, yep, if you enable this, it gets better. And it seems to me it's correct, but you are like, well, that's kind of a boring, boring thing. I mean, a result like that, a got them um, theoretical vector field for the result of this tutorial of course not i'm not gonna let you walk away with that let's make this scene that is on the thumbnail the scene here is made of different little points that are all a certain color and then it forms this nice like a sand but it isn't sand and like this awesome fluid like motion so for that the first thing that we need is points and let, let's add a new object for those points like a plane uh, i'm gonna add some geometry nodes that i'm gonna call points press home to go to this uh, view here and we don't actually need this default plane in. it's just a we're not very important one i'm going to take the fluid in here i'm going to you know call the object itself fluid and where i have the fluid simulation and i'm going to take the plane which i'm going to call uh points so these are going to be the points that are on the surface of our plane but you add those points there is a very simple thing called distribute points on faces for example like 500 points or the density is 500 and you see okay now i have those on the surface and this is like one object the points the fluid is one object points are a separate object however those points are not moving so let's add something to move those with um and we already you know know that we want to move them on every frame uh, because we want to get like an animation kind of similar to this intro scene here so for that let's add a simulation zone because we want to move those points on every frame whatever we want to do on every frame we can put inside here so let's add a set position node to move each one of those points we can for example put like 0 0.01 here and now if you play you know they start to move into this direction into they all move into one direction by the way <laughs> but um, we want to use the velocity of the fluid to move those points so where do we get this um the velocity of the fluid is here and these are the points you know so the, uh, this is already a new kind of geometry so what happens if we just take a named attribute like that and we use the velocity and we i mean we preview this on those points and we see oh okay those points have some velocity but if we play this you know you see the velocity is the same on every frame let's remove the set position you know the fluid velocity is changing but the point velocity isn't so if we put the set position node back here and we connect the velocity to the offset what you see is that they move away in first of course super fast so let's just um, scale down the velocity itself with the time step multiplying with delta t gives the same effect as the uh, you know the fluid in the fluid simulation itself where we make this frame rate independent and therefore having a reasonable speed so now you see okay this works like that but it doesn't look like flu like fluid because the points are moving through themselves but they should be moving you know like a fluid field like you see here and that's because they have the same uh, velocity on every frame so for example if um, uh, the point is appearing here it gets the velocity from here and during the whole lifetime it's just moving on every frame with the same velocity bum bum but what we want to do is that when it moves here it gets a new velocity maybe it moves here maybe it moves here maybe it moves here 
So this is what we want. So we need to reread uh, from the faces of the fluid the same velocity all the time. And for that, let's use sample nearest surface. The sample nearest surface node takes uh, information from the nearest surface to each point. So it suits our case very well. So we can just take the mesh and use the vector and take the velocity from, uh, from this mesh. And let's also, you know, multiply this with delta t. So if you now play this, you see the points are moving, but they are not like, you know, collapsing or anything. They are acting like a real fluid does. So let's, um, let's put this thing uh, here and let's just, you know, group all of that. And let's call this uh, move points. So now we are moving the points, but um, the problem is that when we move them, we get those large, you know, balding kind of holes here where, where we don't have points, which is logical because they move away from there. So, I mean, I can understand why there are no points. So the only solution for that is that we need to add more. But if you make this frame rate a bit longer so that I can show you, if I play this and I change the count here, we don't get any more. And we don't get more because what's before simulation nodes is only executed once, but then at the first frame it's going to be taken into the simulation input, and it's going to be, you know, doing everything that is in the middle here, which is moving the points currently, and then it comes in again, and like that, and again, and this means that whatever we do here is only read in once. So we need to instead add points on every uh, frame. So let's do like that. So if you play this now, does this make things better? Not a lot. Reason is the same. We take in the geometry from the fluid, we add some points on the surface, and then we uh, move the points uh, with, um, with some logic, and then we take in the same points again, and we uh, try to distribute some points on faces, but we don't have any more faces because we only get points in now. So we should, uh, if I go to the second frame, you know, you see we have this uh, input geometry as unsupported type point cloud. So you can't distribute points on a point cloud. What we need to do is that we need to separate the mesh that comes in and we need to feed this in on every frame. So for that, I can use a separate components separates the mesh and the points. So I want to move the points. I'm going to take a join geometry. And currently my system does so that it adds points on every frame and moves the old points that already have been added. But uh, it still doesn't work. You know, the mesh here isn't still a pass through on every frame. So let's connect the mesh, mesh here again. And if we do like that, so then you see something really cool. And let's use a point radius uh, to better visualize this. I'm going to put one centimeter here. And you see we get those lines, like velocity lines, which is a cool effect on its own. I mean, this whole fluid simulation thing is like a gold mine. You know, you discover so many interesting different techniques and, and results that you can do. And one of those is that. But what we want to do is not to get those lines. And those lines appear uh, because... On every frame, we add those points into the exact same locations because the seed is the same. So if we were to change this on every frame, this would result in something more, I would say, natural that doesn't have this uh, liney behavior. So let's do like that. And I see we add them, you know, randomly on every frame, which is awesome, which is cool. Let's play this. And what is the next issue that we are facing? They are going over the border. And this wouldn't be kind of a big problem, but we are dealing with computers and they have a limit. So you see, you know, down here you're using memory, 2.3 gigabytes currently. We should get rid of the points that we are, don't actually need. That And if they are not on the surface of the fluid, uh, they will be just moving by like the closest velocity to them from the surface here, which doesn't make sense. It doesn't look like fluid anymore either way. So let's delete them. For that, I'm going to add a node group called delete points if out of bounds. And I'm going to add this before I move the points because I want to, you know, make those moving calculations on as little points as possible to save on CPU power. Uh, but deletion is or like removal of points is pretty cheap of an operation. So um, 
it's wiser, more wise to do this uh, this way. So now this works like that. Um, and how this node group works is, is it compares if the point is, you know, further than uh, 0.25 on either side. And if it is on X or on Y, it's going to delete them. It only works for boxes, you know, but it is just for this use case, uh, this node group. And now this works, uh, but the problem is the more we play, you see the FPS kind of starts to drop and it starts to drop because uh, we are getting more and more points added to our scene. Uh, if you start out with uh, here, you know, with let's say 100,000 points here, we have already like 400,000 points. So we should delete them if they are older than something, if they've been in our little 3D scene for more than, let's say, 200 frames. Let's delete them. Create an age attribute for each point. What this create age node group does is that inside it takes an age attribute and adds one to it on every frame and does this so for all the points that have been added. Not for the new points because, I mean, the new points on the next frame will be passed to the old points and this is how it works. And now what we need to do is we need to delete uh, points if over age and here we can specify the uh, maximum age. So if I play this, you know, if this is zero, it's gonna, they're just gonna live for one, uh, one second, one frame, sorry. But if I put here like 60 frames, it's gonna be exactly for one second. I have this frame rate up all the time because although I'm constantly adding points, I'm also removing them at the same pace, which is awesome. How this works is that it takes the, stores the, maximum age as an attribute called age max and if the uh, age is larger than the age max it's going to delete them and of course I could have done that as well but we need this for later on I'm going to show you why they appear and I'm going to make them a little bit uh, smaller so that uh, it looks a bit better but to see uh, when you look at this you see this kind of a flickery behavior here and that's because points get added and deleted and they just disappear like toof, 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 like that. And this doesn't make sense. They have like this binary visibility. So let's do so that when they are born, their radius is small. And when they get, you know, grow and grow, get like an adult, they get larger. And when they start to die, they are get deleted. They are going to, you know, shrink off. And this is very possible to do because we know the maximum age of each point. So let's use a node group called animate radius. Uh, done in a stupid way actually but what it does internally is that it uh, maps from the age and the age max um, so uh, ma maps this maps this to a range of 0 to 1 and then ma makes this range with this kind of a shape and then what it does is that it multiplies the resulting thing with a certain radius that we want so let's put here like radius 0 0.01 for example and this is probably too big uh, I'm going to put here another zero. You see some more flickering. That's because the points that appear actually have some kind of radius. So I'm going to put this to zero. And now you see this is very, very smooth because everything that appears is also at uh, the radius of zero. And what dies off is uh, also with the radius of zero. Now our system is ready and looks awesome. But now you need to put the color here. So let's add a material for that. Let's take a set material uh, let's put this here let's actually see what the result of our points is okay we get the points but we also get the grid itself and honestly i don't want to put the material on the grid so i'm gonna use the separate components uh once more and wanna only put put this on the points you know and then join this together with the mesh in the end like that so i can like put two different materials here I'm going to add one for the floor, which I'm going to use here, and one for the points, which I'm going to uh, use for the points themselves. Now, if you switch to cycles, you can see that all those um, points are rendered as spheres. So if you want to do this in EV, you can, but this will get very performance hungry because those icospheres, like you can have like a lot of those. But we have those points here. And let's now open up our shader editor and start to shade them. Um, I'm going to take the floor first. I'm going to just make this black. 
And now if I play this, you see, okay, on the surface we have some uh, points. And for the material of the points, let's add a noise texture first. Because uh, the noise texture is, um, it is a very good way to add those colors here. And I mean, you can add this in different, in different ways. For example, you can use the object coordinates of this thing. But the problem is when the points move, the noise itself, you know, doesn't change too much. So if I add like a greater than comparison here, you know, the points move, but the color doesn't move. So let's do so that we store for each point the location where they come from. And so even if the point, for example, you know, starts here and moves here, it's, it's going to still have the same uh, attribute as the position. So I can, you know, map the texture as it, if it flows with the points. So I'm going to get back to the geometry nodes. And when I create new points, I want to store a named attribute here that is precisely the position of those points, uh, a vector attribute. And I'm going to call this uh, OG uh, POS, like an original position. Um, and now let's go back to our uh, shader editor, press home, find the nodes that we have here. And now if we take an attribute node and we preview the OG POS, we can see something like that. Does this work? Let's use this for the mapping of our noise. And let's see if we start to play this. Doesn't work too much. And this um, can be because of the um, age of the particles. Because currently this is like um, 60 frames. Let's make it like 150. And, and you see, this starts to move much more because uh, the points are alive longer so that it distorts the field much more. And we can put here like maybe 200 uh, and decrease the count of the points a little bit. And we get the nice fluid distorted field. Also, if you want to get the, make the effect stronger, you can go do your fluid sim itself and make the velocity a bit stronger kind of like that and now you see this is much more what i'm talking about you know this looks better much better uh, but it's kind of boring that you add a noise here i mean you can uh, you can get great results with this i made the intro with the noise for example so i'm gonna take an image texture from i believe it's from pixabay or or somewhere whatever where it was from and originally this looks you know kind of like that but then if we distort this and we play this a little bit, you can get something really cool here. Of course, this is not the only uh, picture you can use here. You can use every, anything you, can, you want or, for example, remove some kind of uh, a components from this picture. Like for the thumbnail, I removed the green component of this picture. And now if you add like a lot more points, like let's make sure like 50,000 and you play this, you can get some awesome, awesome, awesome results that you can use in any kind of renders. But how do you make these other things that you saw in the intro? I have an extended tutorial where we built this whole fluid simulation from scratch, also with explanations. And I will show you also how these scenes are made. You can get this from Patreon or you can also get this from um, the Geometry Notes beginner course waitlist which is on badnormals.com. Almost a thousand people have already signed up, which is great, awesome, and we need you. So we have 1,000. This is the last video of this year. I want to fully concentrate on the course, make it the best piece of content I have ever made. So I need time for that. Thank you for your attention. See you soon.